Now, to follow on from this, we will have a panel discussion to include both Per and Nick, and we'll explore in more detail about how organizations approach innovation. We'll split this into two sections, first with guests from outside of the racing and betting sector to get a different perspective and share best practice, followed by some of our colleagues within the industry. Please do submit your questions at any time during the debate using our forum web app, and we will include these in our discussions. But I'd now like to welcome to the stage Per Sandin, the Vice President of Universal Music, and Lalu, the Director of the Web School and Innovation Factory, David Naim from Ernst & Young, who's also an advisor to Perno Ricard, and Vincent Boone, the head of, head of Community for Standing on Giants. Now, we might have heard about concepts like entrepreneurship, startups, incubators, living labs, open innovation, and so on. But what do these concepts actually mean to us when in practice? There are many different methods that companies have for infusing creativity inside their organization. But how can we also ensure that innovation is embedded at the heart of that organization's culture? So if we could start off with yourself, Anne, perhaps you could explain how the Innovation Factory came about um, and how this initiative has brought companies, technology experts, and students together to work collaboratively on ideas generation and innovation projects. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Yeah, just a quick word. So we built the Innovation Factory three years ago. And just one year earlier, we built what something a school, a new uh, school in France called the Web School Factory, which is basically a management school which is dedicated to digital innovation. And basically the, the, the point of view we took is it was great to do management, but in a very rapidly changing world, if you don't understand anything about tech, if you don't understand anything about design, and if you don't understand anything about e-business and e-marketing, you won't be tomorrow's manager. So there was a necessity for a new brand of future managers who could actually, even if they're marketers, understand and talk IT and arbitra make arbitrages on decisions. So that was the really the first idea is actually change the disciplines and take those three key disciplines of digital into the academics. The second thing, and I don't know, I'm sure it's easier in Sweden than in France, but creating a team spirit in a collaborative world is essential to move fast in, in, a, in, a, you know, in digital innovation. And in France, all the education is really based on a very individual world. And therefore, uh, when you're in a project mode, they just don't know how to interact. They don't have the methods. They don't have the, the being of how you should behave for that. So that's really one of the uh, key points of our academics. And the third one was actually to create a dialogue between learning and doing, the learners and the makers, this great movement. And when we went, started going to corporates to see whether they were happy to actually collaborate with us, we realized that indeed, you know, your issue for today, digital transformation, was not an easy one because they just realized that having a Facebook page on for their, you know, a website and a community manager was not digital transformation. It was much worse than that. They had to review completely their offer, their distribution, their organization, and they just didn't quite know how to take get about. As you were saying, Per, all my students are digital natives. So, you know, they have a new user case. They have a completely digital native view on how things should be. And that's how we build the innovation factory. It's a cluster. It's a cluster. It's a space, a physical space, which puts together all the, all the, you know, uh, the stakeholders of digital innovation. We have big, large corporates, and we have a number of which who, uh, you know, like Beer Moon, that's why I'm here today, and thank you. Uh, we have uh, players uh, like startups. We have smaller companies. We've got think tanks, we've got research labs, and we've got a great singularity, which is the student heart. 
our students are in the heart of this movement and they're here to actually generate confrontation with operational teams and see new views. And the way we work is really to put the, together all these populations, to co-create, to co-develop and to do open innovation in a place where indeed you have all the, you know, I would say the usual suspects. The ingredients is a fab lab, a creative lab, an incubator, uh, something which is quite special called an anti-cafe. And it's an anti-cafe because you, you, you consume as much as you want, you just pay on an hourly basis and you take and you can sit down, and you have all the technical material and you can have a little, you know, a meeting room and whatever you want. And it's really the space which we have imagined to actually put together and have all those different populations be able to dialogue. And we have one obsession, which is digital innovation. That's really interesting, Anne. And, uh, Quite fascinating now how many betting organizations in just recent times have um, started to set up innovation groups within their, their own organizations. Um, now moving on to David. Um, David, Naeem, you're an advisor to Perno Ricard who have recently established a breakthrough innovation group known as BIG. Um, that's an open innovation cell within their company. Can you tell us a bit more about that please and, and how that type of concept works? Yeah. I think Bernard Ricard has tried to uh, answer two main questions regarding innovation and digital. The first one is how you organize yourself uh, to uh, foster the innovation. Is it uh, within the existing organization or outside? And I think for that there is an obvious question that uh, you already mentioned uh, is the, the skills that you need, technology, method, uh, data science that you are uh, were also mentioning. But after I think the main question is the management culture because if you were to do some text mining uh, uh, on management speeches, uh, let's say you will have uh, let's say twice a month customer centric and uh, 10 times a day return investment, risk management, operational excellence. So at the end of the day, it's very difficult to really create innovation from inside the company when you are always talking, uh, let's say, against what is innovation, which is, I don't know what uh, will come out of, uh, about innovation. And uh, another point on management culture is that uh, when the, all the top managers uh, are in front of their uh, employees, they say, barbarians are at the gates, Let's, we will be a bride, wh whatever. But uh, in front of the, the in within the employees, you have, uh, let's say, the vast majority of the employees that are below 35, they, they find that it's super cool to work for Uber, Google, so you are just like uh, disconnected for, uh, to your employee. So that's, I think, the first answer uh, that uh, gave uh, Pernod Ricard on this is to create this big, which is apart from the company. So they don't have uh, any uh, quantitative objective. They are in another location. There are a few uh, s uh, set of people, like uh, a bit less than 10 or 15 uh, right now, I guess. And they are uh, on the long-term uh, approach and they are, let's say, kind of authorized to disrupt the company. So it's a very interesting approach, creating a lot of, so, of challenges. And after, I think the second uh, very important question is how you connect with the ecosystem and, uh, and, uh, and the startups. Uh, the problem of the large corporates is that they, uh, it uh, reminds me of uh, Hoff Moss and Men, you know, uh, you, we all read the, the story of Lenis, uh, like a, a big sumo trying to give a hug to a very small cat. So at the end of the day, it's the, you are just uh, killing the startups uh, in most, uh, and the, the mechanism is always the same. You, you, you do a digital fair, then uh, you find some uh, very interesting startup, and then you say, oh, there is very interesting competitive advantage in this one. So you invest, and then on top of the investment, you create some exclusivity contract, uh, and then you prevent uh, the startup to work with uh, virtually all the other uh, companies, and then you forget the startup, and then the, it dies. Uh, so we know all the story, and uh, some, some maybe someone of uh, of you uh, lived personally this story. Uh, so what uh, has been created within Big is this idea of reverse incubation, meaning that we first start to think about the strategy. Uh, for instance, could be let's uh, develop the market in China, then let's develop the market for female, whatever it is, uh, and then after you find an existing startup, not a new one that you want to invest in, but an existing startup, and you try 
to help this startup to develop this business, uh, being a client, not specifically an investor, but a client. That's, uh, and I think it's very, uh, let's say, uh, bon sens <laughs> type of approach, uh, but it's very interesting because it's connected to the, to the strategy of the company and then it's helping uh, the startup and not the other way around. So I think it's uh, uh, these uh, two uh, pillars, so the management culture and then the, the way you connect to the ecosystem uh, has been very, very successful for Pernod Ricard and we see that uh, uh, in EY very, very successful also for other companies that are adopting this type of approach. I think the, the culture within an organization is obviously vital, and we'll explore that a little, a little bit further now. Um, Vincent, you, you've worked at the cutting edge of technology within the computer gaming industry, and obviously more recently with telecommunications. So how much does innovation really drive the strategy for the organizations that you've worked with? Um, yeah, so for me, um, I've uh, worked for many, many years in the computer games industry where obviously uh, innovation is key. Um, you know, gaming is, is moving very fast and we constantly have to come up with new concepts to keep people entertained. Uh, but from there, I kind of moved uh, on to a, a little bit of a beast uh, called Telefonica, which is, um, you know, quite of a you know, big organization, big telco all over the world. Um, largely based in um, South America, but also a, a lot in Europe. Um, but they got me over from the computer games industry because they thought, you know, we start a, an, an, you know, we do a new startup called GIFCAF, which is um, uh, basically an MVNO, which is basically a virtual mobile network, i.e. doesn't own any of its own hardware. It's just purely a software layer over someone else's network. Um, and the idea of that was we start up this new network we get a small team in, uh, there were only nine of us when we started a, a telco. Um, and the idea was it wouldn't even have a traditional customer call center. It wouldn't have any retail shops whatsoever, purely online. Um, and it would only have a very, very simple kind of offer. I, you pay four pence for a text, eight pence for a phone call, and we didn't even have a, a, you know, a way to charge for mobile data yet. So in terms of what you said, prayer, yes, it was purely going out there as a beta. It took us about a year to actually develop the way to, uh, to actually charge for mobile data. Um, and so the, the, you know, the, the sense of where I was brought in was also around the sort of like social side of things and the community side of things. So I had to implement uh, a community of customers that would actually help us do uh, all of the customer service, the sales, the marketing, uh, and actually also a lot of the development in terms of the product side um, and, and a lot of other things that we did as a company. Um, and so that's kind of um, you know, how we managed to actually you know, change the cost structure of that business because normally a telco is very uh, heavily costed through the marketing side, as well, uh, the retail side and the customer service side. And we've managed to really, really change that kind of model up on its head. Um, and GiftCaf has become a huge success. And even though we don't have any of the sort of like traditional channels, um, you know, the customers absolutely love the way we interact with them and we've put them really at the heart of our business. Um, so they're the ones who constantly, you know, shape our product. So whereas we originally started out with those three, you know, simple products, um, we now have a whole range of products which all have been, you know, um, created by our customers. So, you know, the reality of that is where we, you put your, your customer at the heart of your business, we implement one idea every three days that comes up through that community, which obviously means that as a business and the way you actually run that business and the roadmap you have is completely different from a traditional telco where you maybe do maybe one, maybe two releases a year, right? And then you try and get them all right. And there's only a couple of small changes that you do. Whereas for us, we're just constantly innovating, constantly trying things out, see whether they work or not. Uh, and that's been, been the real you know, challenge, but also the, the big difference in terms of how the company works. And it's now outcompeted 140 other MVNOs uh, within the UK. You know, and that's just in a couple of years. Great, well that's fascinating. And um, obviously we'll be returning to that later, this idea of um, a, a customer-centric approach and, and very much putting communities at the heart of your product. Um, Vincent will be joining us later on um, to do a more detailed presentation on that. Um, moving across to Pear, um, it was interesting obviously to hear about your experiences within the music industry, but how did you manage to overcome the obvious resistance to, ch resistance to change 
um, and the complacency that had previously existed in your organization? As I said earlier, you know, it, it, we didn't have a choice. You know, for us, we went so down the drain. So if we wanted to survive, we had to change. Uh, and I mean, when you're an alcoholist, you know, it's not until you uh, want to change that you can change your habits. And I think that's what's actually happened to us. That will happen to the TV industry today, I guarantee you. They will go, they will say, oh, we, we, as people watch TV still, <laughs> you know, whatever. You know, let them believe them themselves. But, you know, they, and the interesting thing is that you always, because I like what we talk about the consumer in the middle, because you always want to put yourself in uh, to be part of the solution. So when TV stations today talks about innovation in the future, they see themselves in this food chain every time. But I'm not sure they're going to be in the food chain. No one watched the TV channel. We watched programs on, you know, on, on, on demand. That's the future of everything. And I think you know, what we talk about here also is because when, when you have this change, and uh, we, have, we have to do something. What do we do? You know, we have to test things, and there's a limited budget. And I think that's, and that's the most dangerous thing of all. You know, no one dares to innovate because we don't have, you take out the R&D investments because you, know, you have to get your EBITDA, you know, because you have the revenues decreasing. And that's the most dangerous thing you do because then you're going to die. Then you're going to be the new Kodak you know, or the new Nokia or whatever. The key thing is to, I think, to have a, every year on the Christmas party or wherever, you have a, should have a fuck up price, you know? Some of them really, really fucked it up, you know, big time, you know? Because, you know, if, if you don't dare people to fuck up, then y if you don't uh, allow people to fail, because that's what's going to happen next in a situation when, where, where your margins are going decreasing, you don't allow fuck ups. And I think that's also very dangerous. Today, I, I was uh, at a healthcare company and they fired all their R&D department, all their professors. You previously, in the, in the, the, the days of innovation, you put, uh, put all smart people into the same room to work together on developing new drug. And the problem, uh, that was good you know, 50 years ago, but today, if you have the same people in the same room, having lunch together, doing the same thing together, there's no innovation. So now the healthcare companies are firing their R&D departments letting uh, people go out there and professors and, and scientists develop something in startups and then they buy them. For yeah, they, uh, for a fortune, but it's still cheaper for them. When they do the P&Ls, it's cheaper for them to buy these startups than to have people s sitting in, in, in the same room. Yes, go to yourself in this room. If you want to, we talk about innovation. If you, uh, during your you know, traditional weekdays, you go to the same restaurants with the same people, have the same food, every day by day by day. Do you think you're innovative? I don't think so. You're throwing away you know, opportunities. Because if you change your behavior every day, you're gonna meet people, you're gonna have, you're gonna have to see so much challenges, so much different things happen to you. So you have to challenge yourself. I w one thing I was thinking of when Nick did, did this presentation, because it's all about, I mean, I mean in, in the business creating stars, and going back to Facebook and internet. You know, the, American pharaoh, you know, look at the in Insta, do, do all horses have an Instagram page, page or a Facebook page? They should. If you want to connect with them, if you should focus on building the interest for the, for the jockeys, for the trotters and for the horses, then everything else will follow. When Premier League and Champions League, is it's all about the game. You know, love watching the games and then everything else follows. Focus on what the your consumer wants, what they what what they, what they like. If you have a, if you get them, and those it's a French horse. I think is going to on Sunday is a big thing. You can win the third. Is that correct? Yeah. How look on that horse? Is does that horse have a Facebook site, Insta, Snapchat? Do you have a do you have a social media manager for that horse? If not, you should. That's the future of getting more people to watch it, because people love stars. Some really interesting points there. I think um, leading on from that, what will be really interesting, I think, is asking David next, um, how can you ensure that innovation um, runs through the whole culture of the, the organization as a whole, rather than just being the responsibility of just a small team of individuals? I would say that it's, a, uh, again, I think a question of management. I think uh, there is something very important there. I think if you go to your team as manager and say you have to innovate, 
uh, then they are, I think the only thing you create is a lot of stress. A lo I mean, a dangerous one huh, because uh, like the, the burnout type of stress that you, you can have on, a, on a, an organization. Because the, the truth of the matter is that not everyone can innovate. So I think you have, uh, and it's not only, uh, I mean, the consulting stuff, uh, what, what I will say is you have to be uh, a bit more uh, precise in the what you say around the innovation and uh, let's and, uh, and the, the fact to innovate. There is first, I think you can ask 100% of your employees to say, uh, you have to innovate, uh, let's say, the incremental way. So you have to innovate in the way you are uh, working every day, in the way you are improving your processes, in the way you are listening to your cons uh, customer. So that's first. And then you can ask, let's say, 30% of the people, that the, the, the manager, the head of marketing, head of sales, head of uh, tech, whatever, to say you have to invent uh, something which is a bit stretch uh, from your uh, current business, uh, new offers and then uh, new ways of uh, serving the customer, whatever. And then uh, you can't ask, uh, I would say, anyone to say you, can, you, you need to invent uh, something which is breakthrough. You just need to protect, uh, again, as a uh, big uh, uh did, you just have to protect uh, a small part of the organization and then a small set of uh, people to say, okay, let's invent something. But you can't put some KPIs on this. Uh, but if you, uh, if you just say innovation uh, like this, uh, it doesn't work. So uh, again, uh, just be a bit more precise on what is innovation and then you can manage the innovation a bit more um, accurately, I would say. I think there's a huge contradiction and tension within the corporates whereby first we've got more difficult markets and most corporates were in the situation where Per was talking about. I, therefore, all the employees are focused on their regular job and then they're being told, but we're in danger, please innovate. So not only do they actually work more and under more pressure because the market is more difficult, but in the same time, they're asked to have a completely different vision of the world. And one model I find interesting on that is a company I know where, at, and they start at the senior level, any senior partner, because it's a partnership in there, m is not allowed to actually invoice 100% of his time. I, he must always have 10% of his time to just open his eyes to the world and observe and bring in information and see what's going on. And to be able to actually bring that back into the company and create, um, a territoire, a, a, a place where actually ideas can emerge. And I really think that we are in a very particular time where, you know, the traditional corporates are actually fighting and they're suffering and they're also being up challenged on innovation. And it, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Uh, if, if I can, I mean, uh, what I, what exactly what we just said, you know, it wasn't the music industry who saved the music industry, it was Spotify, an outsider, you know, who was innovating by themselves. We, at the same time, I'm going to give you two examples. In 2004, we put together a team, and the smart guys uh, said, okay, who, what should we do to, because this internet is coming? So our view, because we want to be in the food chain, we said, okay, let's have a community, a secured community in the US. We had 200 households. We gave them a, a great computer, g great broadband, uh, a C, um, a C CD burner, burning CDs, a four, uh, four uh, color printer, um, and then the idea was that, and then we, we send all of them some, you know, the discs and also, you know, the jewel cases. Because our idea of internet was that you download your album, you burn it on a CD, you print the, uh, the booklet, and you put it in the envelope and put it up on the shelf at home. That's how we thought. You mean we just didn't understand, you know, that's how we was thinking, that was our innovation inside the company. Another thing was that we, you know, Comcast, which is the, you know, the biggest broadband provider in the U.S., we, we, we had a young uh, s smart kid saying, okay, let's, do, let's let them download through their Comcast. And then they said, it, at this time, 2004 or 5, they said, it takes too long time to download an album. It's not consumer friendly. And then the young kid said, but why don't we just let them download singles? And you know what the presidents of the company said? Oh, oh, oh. Singles, then we lose our business model because it's all about uh, creating a single, getting a, you know, some attention, and then we sell the album. That's the way we make money. 
So we said, no, 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 don't sell singles. And what's the business of today? It's all about you picking a song, listening to a song. So it's, and this also came inside. It's, I think it's so important to, to you have to accept that maybe because of the tradition and history in the, the environment we are discussing here today, you have to have an outsider view on this. That idea about whether it comes from inside or outside of an organization is really interesting because a lot of the innovation and change is obviously forced upon us. Um, another question then for, for yourself, um, Vincent, is do you, from your experience, is it easier for the small startups to innovate than the large organizations because of their size, because of the culture, the tradition, the history that Per referred to? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's much harder for a larger company to innovate, um, which is also why, obviously, GiveCaf was set up, and, and we were um, set up in a completely different office as well. So we were completely separate from the main business. Uh, and even now, I've taken what I did at GiveCaf out and set up Standing on Giants, and again, it's, it's out of the main office kind of thing. Um, so I think for us, the, the, the frustrating bit is, is that um, with GiveCaf and the whole community side of things, and similar to with Standing on Giants, where we're basically delivering these communities to different businesses, um, at first, just within Telefonica, now outside as well, but the, the, the thing is we've proven the concept, right? It completely works. However, actually implementing this within the rest of Telefonica has proven incredibly difficult because there's a lot of resistance, right, within these bigger corporates to actually say, oh, well, these guys, you know, kind of innovated. At first, obviously, it was like, ah, oh, you know, they were set up like that, and so therefore it only works for a small company like that. And then it was, oh, well, it only works for, for the younger generation, not for the older generation, that kind of stuff. Until we actually, again, proved the case within, you know, sort of like the, the more traditional kind of telcos that they already had, and again, it was kind of working. However, actually pushing any real volume through that kind of community is still really, really hard. But now working with different companies like Airbnb, for example, you just see that their, their mentality and the way they think is completely different. So working with these types of companies that are already kind of like startups, the, they're, them bringing them new ideas and incorporating that in their business is a lot faster. So, you know, I don't have the actual answer to that on, on how you as a big corporate, you know, change that mentality because often the problem is, is that the CEOs of the company, they get it, right? They see there is a need for change. The people, you know, lower down the ranks, they get it as well. They're excited, they're often young, right? They understand what needs to change and they understand, you know, bringing the customer at the heart of the business and communicating with them is incredibly important. It's actually all of the people in the middle that have been there for, you know, I don't know, five, ten years or whatever, they just don't want that change. They're scared of it. They don't understand it. They think, geez, I've got so much to do already in my day job. How the hell am I going to fit this in? Right? And that's, that's kind of the, the, the problem. And, you know, for me, I think for, you know, the CEO gets it fine, right? But then you still need to set apart, you know, a, se a separate budget where you allow, you know, a group of people within that company to actually, you know, free roam and actually start actually implementing these things that you see around you and actually have specific forces, task forces within that company that actually make that change. If you don't allow that budget, people already have a day job. How are they going to now do all of a sudden something, you know, completely different and new? It's actually, I was a professor in, in Stockholm who, who had, um, had a presentation and he went through all um, board uh, protocols and the management um, protocols for 20 years for Nokia and from Kodak and from a Swedish company in, in typewriters called Fawcett. And we think, and I also make fun of, you know, they didn't do anything, they didn't believe, and Nokia said we didn't believe in that. But if you read the, the documents, you know, from C-level people, they were scared to death. They tried everything in, inside, you know. So y the, the outside believer is that they didn't do anything. But they tried, Kodak tried everything, but they were too big to be able to change. And I think you're totally right. It's uh, the, middle, the middle management that are really afraid of change. Overcoming that resistance uh, to change is obviously very key. You were going to add, um, David. Uh, because th there is a uh, resistance to change, but after all, there is also uh, 
sometimes the uh, good awareness of what is happening, but uh, very, very strong concerns on, uh, let's say, social impact. And I think the telco, the what happened on the French telco market a few years ago is very striking for that because, you know, they, they started Orange, SFR, and, and Bouygues, they started to go for online type of business. So it was Soj, BNU, I think here. And, uh, but the, the way they started this is was fighting back uh, the, the, the free and the, the, the newcomers. But, and they started to, to say that these offers, uh, that they are targeting low-cost type of consumers. After one year, one year, it was representing 50%, 50% of the sales. But the problem is that the team that are uh, running the SOG, the BNU, there are a bunch of like uh, 50 persons, okay? Not more. The, the team that are working, the marketing and the rest, it's uh, 100 times and, the, and it's not a, the order of magnitude is this. So at the end of the day, they have 50% of the sales uh, done by uh, 50 person. So they know that, but after there is a question of, so uh, it's not only change management, it's social impact, it's uh, economical impact. So it's the... Uh, I think it's best, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely, that investment is key. But I think, um, from my experience, uh, there's no shortage of of good ideas. The problem is, is that they often stagnate in that incubation phase um, because there isn't that commitment. Um, so, how can you ensure that those projects are managed um, from conception all the way through to implementation? Well, if I had the answer, I'd be very rich. Uh, I have, you know, we, what we do at the Innovation Factory is we create a place where we put acceleration on that sort of aspect for companies. And I, we have one great example, which is very, you know, which we like, which on a project, student project we did with Accor Hotel, which is the largest hotel group, you know, in the, amongst the largest in the world. Students actually were asked the question, new users and, you know, what connected, what IoT in hotels tomorrow? And a group of students actually created the connected um, chariot. You know, what was it called? Chariot. Chariot. Great. Thank you. Um, which was, you know, a, a great idea because it actually optimized the communication between the front desk, the, the house cleaners, and all that. And then the chairman said, "Okay, they did it in 36 hours. I want it in less than six months in one of my hotels." And that was complete panic amongst the teams. Um, and in fact, when we analyzed and saw how we could help them, I said, well, we've got the startup who could actually do the prototyping, but it actually doesn't fit any of the official standards of uh, the buying um, scheme of Accor, i.e. they not normally, they wouldn't be allowed to work with such a small company because they would represent 95% of its revenues over a six month period, blah, blah, so that's forbidden. So they had to overcome that. And then they had to say, we're not going to review the actual, uh, you know, specs. We're actually going to, because they started saying, we're going to work on the specs uh, with the students. Is. And I said, yeah, but then in two years time, we're still working on the specs of the perfect chariot. If we do it exactly how the students did it, it'll be ready in six months. And that's what we did. We actually went very fast. And the key lesson for the corporate was, you know, prototyping quick and dirty is cheap. If it fails, it doesn't hurt. If it doesn't fail, it's great, and you can move forward. And that culture is really difficult because it's the quick and dirty culture. Still, you know, you have to invest money. You have to bring. You have to have an environment where you can do it. And so, Innovation Factory is one of those environments. I think lots of you know, there's lots of options on the market, but it is a very difficult thing for the large corporates and, in particular, the IT organisations and their processes to actually imagine that you can do something quick and dirty and which actually if it works you'll have to redo it completely you actually will have to start again from scratch because then it will have to work into all the processes of the company and i think in fact in all these ideas and in all these uh, innovation today you have a lot of tech into it and tech is actually where it starts being very difficult and you have to sort of take an independence of that and do a completely independent product which will fit in 
within the corporate later. And that's also a bit the idea of big. I, you know, if you do it outside, that's what Google X does. You do it outside and you see later, if it works, you bring it back when within the company and you didn't try to fit to all the corporate standards from day one because otherwise, two years later, you're still there. Um, I think something that needs to be added to what you've just said is to give it time. Right? So the one of the problems that we had as well is that, yeah, all right, we were very inno innovative and all of that, but it takes a while for d this kind of stuff to start working. Right? So when they compared it to you know, the normal sort of operations of setting up a telco and you know, the investment needed for that and how quickly you get a return on that investment, it just didn't apply at all to what we did. So for us, you know, we were um, you know, not growing at all as a company for you know, about a year. And after that, it, yes, there was a, like, sort of like a hockey stick curve in terms of how quickly we started getting customers. But it's because it is, you know, that kind of like, especially because we weren't in retail, uh, we didn't do any commercials on TV, anything like that. So it was purely kind of like an online type thing. So in that type of environment, you know, you need a while to start building up that kind of brand awareness. And, you know, and especially with when you're innovating, you know, you need to constantly tweak at everything you do. And if you don't allow time to do all of those tweaks and slowly figure out where you're going wrong and what you're doing right, uh, you know, it's definitely going to fail. I think it was very interesting what you said earlier about a new idea every three days because, again, um, increasing the rate and speed of change is critical in today's environment. Um, the old way of um, implementing innovations um, over a 12 to 18 month period, that's just becoming outdated. Um, really interesting debate. Thank you, everyone, for your contribution. Um, before we add, um, open it up to the floor, I just have a question come through on the web app. This one's for Pear. Um, when the music business realized that people were turning to pirate websites to listen to music, did anyone try to provide the public with a legal paid service to download music? Yes. Uh, yes, we did. But in, in uh, and it was a guy called Steve Jobs, who 2003, you know, put out uh, that you know, proposition, uh, and then it was um, in 2004 for the rest of the world, so to say. But you know, it's in Sweden, no one really cared to download m music because you know the, everything was free if you download through illegal sites, you know. And in Sweden, it was it was a common feeling that you know it's it was okay. Actually, my wife said when we you, you learn to know new friends through your kids uh, from school, and said, when we were invited to some friend's house for dinner, you know, she said to me, "Don't t you know this was 2006 or something? Don't tell anyone what you work with tonight, okay? Please, pair, you know, don't you know? Because what happened then was, she work, what do you do? I work in the music business. Oh, that must be tough. Why? I said, you know, because uh, we don't buy anymore. So why? What do you do? We download it from you know, on the internet. So you steal? No, we don't. Of course you do. Yeah, and then you know, uh, it's better you get drunk than you get tell what you work with. You know. So for me, it was a very, very special situation, and and uh, and we tried. But the the common feeling in in uh, what you say in in Sweden was that. If you can, if you can do it easy, and no one is offended, you know. But eventually, the artists, the I mean, even the, the movie directors and the, the actors came together, and no one really cared about the music companies or the film dis dis distributors. It was in the end, it was the artists who, in the end, get up and complain. That's how it was changed. Yeah, they care yeah, exactly. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Um, we will now move on, but thank you for all of your time, for, to David, to Pear, to Anne, and to Vincent. Thanks, everyone.